Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Flicks the Church for God. This is the show that digs into the deep and sometimes spiritual world and themes of horror. Um, This is the uh, second part in a series of episodes looking at the work of cosmic horror writer H.P. Lovecraft. Now, if you want to hear me talk about why a Christian like me um, can enjoy someone so dark and depressing, perhaps, as H.P. Lovecraft, then check out part one of the video where I explore his upbringing and I reflect on his intriguing, I think, theology that he offers. But tonight I'm going to be, uh, today rather, um, I'm going to be uh, flagging up some of my favourite stories of Lovecraft by sharing one of my favourite literary presentations of his work, which is the new annotated H.P. Lovecraft by Leslie S. Klinger. It's just sitting off camera and I'll bring it on in a moment. But just as a way of introduction, like many young people in the 1980s, um, I first became aware of H.P. Lovecraft when I saw Reanimator, which I briefly reviewed in in my podcast. Um, That was the film that really introduced me to this intriguing name, Lovecraft, although I remember not that long after I spotted the name Lovecraft in Leicester Square in London above a shop and I thought, oh my word, it's a specialist shop for Lovecraft stuff and I remember going towards it and then quickly realising as I approached it that it was actually a sex shop dedicated to the craft of love. Um, I made a rather hasty exit. But yes, I loved the film Reanimator and it made an impression on me the ideas of it and just that something about this guy's name Lovecraft was it was really intriguing so around the same time as this uh, my friends were really into playing role well some of them were really into playing role-playing games now I wasn't particularly into it because they played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons stuff that wasn't really my scene now I, I say that because it's nothing to do with the fact that I'm a Christian thinking Dungeons and Dragons is devilish or something it's not it's, it's fine there's nothing wrong with playing stuff like that but and besides I wasn't even a Christian back then so it didn't even feature the fact is I just wasn't really into fantasy you know like fire of wrath and send in the orcs and all this sort of stuff that does not really do it for me I'm not really into fantasy now I don't particularly watch Game of Thrones I'm not that into Lord of the Rings dare I say it but they they started playing a game called Call of Cthulhu which had these amazing covers and I remember looking at them with like weird monsters yes but they were set against a real world backdrop with period cars and vintage outfits and I, pl- I, I said oh, I'm gonna play that one with you and I played it and I, I made a special mixtape of creepy soundtracks to get the atmosphere as we played I think we um, did quite a lot of uh, the Pet Cemetery soundtrack and the Shining soundtrack but I was a casual role-playing gamer at best instead I just felt really drawn to the world the games were set in or the, the, the world this game was talking about and so I started cutting out the middleman and I went out seeking Lovecraft books directly and here are some of the first books that I laid my hands on these were three volumes though I only have two of them here and they were fantastic in addiction to his work um, I remember being struck by two of the quotations on the cover um, Firstly, there's a one by Stephen King, um, which says the 20th century horror stories, dark and baroque prints, which I always thought was a little bit of a clunky um, sort of way of putting it. But, you know, it made me think of some wispy dandy writing this scary book. But I was quite excited to see his name on it, Stephen King's, because I was and still am a fan of uh, his work. Um, But there was also on the back of this one in particular, um, a quotation from the Sun newspaper. Now, you've got to understand the Sun newspaper in in Britain, in the UK, is a tabloid paper. Um, It's not really known for its big sort of... Uh, promotion of the literary arts as it were in fact it recently only only recently I think stopped showing topless women on page three every time you opened it you'd get you know bare breasts on there so um, not the type of person you'd think you'd find a lot of Lovecraft appreciation Um, however on the back of this one it says go thou to HP Lovecraft and shudder (laughs) the Sun Now, not only that, they had these hideous and intense looking covers, which even now are a little bit queasy. Uh, Just the other day, I was going to a parent and toddler group at uh, the church that I'm part of, and I thought, oh, I'll I'll well, my kid's playing, I'll read a bit of Lovecraft. But but this but these particular editions of the book have just such like grotesque pictures on the front. You can imagine that some of the people there um, will be quite keen to like move their chairs away from you if you're reading these editions. But anyway, they've got a great selection of stories. But later on, I um, bought the 
uh, the modern classics from Penguin version, uh, Call of Cthulhu, and other weird stories. And what I especially liked about this presentation was that not only did it have helpful inf introductions by St. Joshi or Joshi, I never know how to say his name, and also it has a series of footnotes in it. And to be fair, when you're reading H.P. Lovecraft, the period nature of his work leaves you scratching your head sometimes, working out what the heck's he talking about here. And so footnotes and annotations are really quite helpful. So yeah, I really enjoyed this book, but that was until last year. And last year is when the ultimate H.P. Lovecraft book dropped through my door from an Amazon delivery man, especially, I think, trained in handling heavy goods. Well, at least he would have had to have been because he brought me this one moment <laughs> he brought me this the annotated hp lovecraft by leslie s klinger now this book is is stunning it's a beautiful book perhaps one of the finest presented books that i have i mean look at that cover it's just like cool like and while you could take the jacket off if you wanted to if you really wanted to and walk around um with what looks like the grim reaper's address book under your arm this dust jacket just has this gorgeous art deco tentacle vibe going on um and it's a credit to the designers jam design who put this book together and the great design continues inside um it's a really pleasing layout within, and I love the use of red ink for footnotes and annotations, or rather, and white, and there's lots of like white space. That, so, and because there's lots of white space, you feel like this is a, a page turner, even though there's like 852 leaves of information here. But of course, good design isn't going to save a book with, if the, the, the words themselves are cruddy. And while Lovecraft stories are obviously a no-brainer, they simply deliver, um, the annotations that Klinger puts in here are really helpful and are very well thought through. Sometimes you'll read a Lovecraft story and he'll use an antiquated word that you've never heard of, and chances are Klinger is going to have a quick explanation of that word at the side of the page so you can quickly work out where exactly you are. But something I especially loved um, was that in, in, in his stories, Lovecraft would simple, sometimes refer to science um, and art. And for example, with, with, in, with regards to art, um, he would reference a piece of art in his stories, but then Kling, Klinger will reproduce that piece of art right next to it on the page. So for example, in his short story, The Picture in the House, where Lovecraft's talking about a book that keeps falling open at a picture of a gruesome butcher shop in the land of cannibals, it's all pretty grim, the actual picture he's referring to is directly over leaf, um, which just really adds to the sense of immersion into these stories. Even though obviously they're immersive already, but being able to see the picture that Lovecraft had in mind that is actually within this story is very uh, good i like that every now and again he'll also include the Klinger will also include original artwork from the stories that were printed from the magazines or even reprints of lovecraft's own visualizations of these stories and one of my favorite lovecraft tales happens to be lovecraft's own favorite which is called the color out of space where a strange meteor lands and causes the surrounding countryside to die and rot and he calls it the blasted heath um, it's really good in the book to be able to see Lovecraft's own drawings, visualizations of this blasted heath that he had in mind, as well as parts of his handwritten manuscript, all there alongside the story. Uh, just to um, talk a little bit about the color out of space, I love that tale because it's, it's it, not least because of its brain crunching properties. The meteor uh, houses a color that nobody, no scientist can really categorize because it's not any shade of any known color, but literally it's a brand new color completely on a different spectrum. And just how mind bending is that to try and imagine a color that has no relation to any color you already know. But then the meteor starts to rot the surrounding vegetation and turns the local farmers into these weird beings. And the part where the farmer's wife is on is in her room at night, crawling on all floors. Uh, sorry, craw crawling on her floor, um, and 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 glowing in the dark still gives me the chills. And I mentioned that one image to my daughter, my six-year-old daughter, the other day, and she just freaked out on hearing this image of a, of a woman crawling around on all fours and glowing in the dark and speaking strangely. 
Another story I really love is The Shadow of Irinsmouth, which is about a young man who is drawn to a mysterious fishing town where nobody ever seems to blink. It's a brilliant, it's a gripping tale which really has a strong sense of place to it. Whenever I read it I, uh, or think about it, I really get a strong and vibrant sense of what it must have been like to be in this town that everybody else avoids and yet he, the man in the story, uh, Olmstead, he, he wants to go there and, uh, and we want to go there too. Klinger adds the sense of place about Innsmouth by chucking in street maps and things like that so you can get a real sense of where Robert Olmsted, the, the, the main character, the narrator, is, it is and, and what he's doing in his location. I think that's great. The finale, by the way, of um, Innsmouth is, is really fast-moving and thrilling stuff leading to a killer climax. It's quite the sort of adventure story, really, which makes it all the more odd to hear that Lovecraft himself thought so little of this particular tale. He wrote to his friend and um, later a man who put out a lot of his work, August Derleth, and said to him at the time, he says, he said, Innsmouth has all the, the, the defects I deplore, especially in the point of style where hackneyed phrases and phrases and rhythms have crept in despite all precautions. Nor I do not intend to offer the shadow of Innsmouth for publication, for it would stand no chance of acceptance. <laughs> it's like, what? Oh my word. Indeed, this story was rejected, but Durl have kept being fascinated by it like many people have been, and it was eventually published as a slim book, the only book of his work to ever come out while he was alive. And um, a version of it was made um, by Stuart Gordon called Dagon, which I really think is a pretty cool film. You know, there's plenty more great stories that I could talk about. Of course there is. We could talk about the epics like At the Mountains of Madness and The Call of Cthulhu, a key story, of course, which are just excellent. But there are other lesser known tales, um, like The Festival, for example, which I think really capture, at least captures my imagination. The Festival is a Christmas story um, like none other, where a man joins... Um, a procession. He goes to his uh, a town called Kingsport and he joins a procession which eventually leads him to some very strange experiences. Um, and it's not so much even a story. It's not got a lot of plot in it. It's just like an evocation of strange imagery and great geography. Like the place just feels real in your mind. I can really picture it. And it's strangely grotesque and yet weirdly beautiful um, what occurs in that story. I'm a big fan of that one. Um, I also love his early story Dagon um, about a man who is um, lost on the sea only to discover that the weird black sludge and slime around him can be walked upon. And he starts walking upon it and he suddenly uh, starts to come to encounter this weird god thing called Dagon. It's a very short piece. Um, um, but the build-up is great, and the hyperbole of the language, the melodrama of the end, the final paragraph makes it sort of irresistible. Um, actually, in fact, it's worth mentioning the final paragraphs of Lovecraft's work. Um, he, Indeed, the final lines, um, he has just this habit of working everything up to the, his stories up to a final sort of reveal, a final climax. And many of his tales seem to hinge on the very final line, often in italics. And I know that sometimes when I read his work, I can see that italicized line out of the corner of my eye, and I want to read it. My eye is drawn to it, and I have to sort of fight against it to cover it with my, my hand. So I follow the proper rhythm, you know, to reach the final cosmic horror sucker punch the way he designed. Um, sometimes those, they just draw your eye, and you want to read them before anything else. Now, obviously, there are plenty of more Lovecraft stories that need to be mentioned, and we'll look into those in the next few episodes uh, where we talk about some of the audio productions and films and things like that some of the movies because he's got plenty of good material but for now let me just wrap this um, episode up with a few words about Klinger himself um, and uh, just in case anyone's put off by buying this because um, of their previous experience with Klinger's work I, I say that because I suspect that there might be some readers out there who are a little hesitant about um, buying the new annotated Lovecraft because they've had they've read Klinger's new annotated Dracula which I have here which I've also look, got um now, this happens to be a book which I, I was, I've been reading um, at the end of last year and the beginning of, of this year because it was, it was helping me prepare for um, a travel piece I was writing when I visited um, Transylvania earlier this year, um, what, which I was writing for the 14 Times magazine. And, you know, it was a great way of ticking something off my bucket list too. 
But Klinger does something in the annotated Dracula that ticked off some of his um, readers. And frankly, I I've got to admit, I found it quite challenging um, and stopped me enjoying the book quite as much as I could have. You see, in it, he suggests that the story of Dracula actually happened in reality. And so his footnotes are written with this sort of gentle fiction in mind. In other words, you read the annotations in the annotated Dracula and they talk as if there really was a Jonathan Harker. There really is or was a, a Van Helsing. Now, there will be some people out there who will really get a kick out of that and enjoy that fun little ruse. But for me, I did find it quite distracting and challenging because I, I just wanted to know about Stoker's book and struggled to trust the footnotes because I was getting tired of trying to sift through what might be fiction and what might be fact, um, which was a real shame because um, the book itself has is, is got lots of great information on the novel and on Stoker and um, about the Victorian age that's taking place in. So I, I may well give it another try and um, you know dig back deeper into it, but it's, it could be a frustrating read for some. So therefore, I spoke to some people who have read Klinger's Dracula, and he said, this man had said to me that he didn't want to read the annotated Lovecraft because he couldn't cope with Klinger's Dracula approach. Indeed, I actually think Klinger did the same thing, um, the maybe it's real angle, with his annotated Sherlock Holmes, but I haven't read that. I just read somewhere. I think he does the same sort of gambit with that. However, rest assured that the annotated Lovecraft puts straight and factual annotations in and they are almost always fascinating and they add a depth um, without any tonal confusion. Um, so, you know, don't worry so much about that. Add to that the fantastic presentation and you get a superb addition to any Lovecraft fan shelf. No, it's not definitive in terms of a collection because it does lack some of the key stories. I mean, one of the oft-quoted emissions here is the the outsider and i suppose there might be some readers who might feel distracted i guess by um notes and pictures and maybe even find they take the reader out of the story um as originally intended maybe you know i did it the right way around of just reading the stories on their own first in earlier years but for me, knowing many of these tales already, Klinger's work just opens up and deepens the world of Lovecraft. And the result, I think, is an absolute treat. I love that book, this book. I've lugged this book. I've loved it, lugged this bad boy around many a pub and coffee shop and get the sense that I'll be doing this as well for the f in the future and many years to come because Lovecraft's work is the type of stuff that bears reading again and again. I hardly um, ever read novels more than once i don't think i've ever really read a novel more. oh i would read dracula again um but lovecraft feels different because his stories are often more like experiences than pure plot perhaps that's why they keep inspiring fresh interpretations and for that you should join me in the next episode where i'm going to be talking about the hp lovecraft historical society's dark adventure radio theater series where lovecraft comes to life in audio but until next time, firstly, don't forget to subscribe uh, to my YouTube channel. That'd be cool. Um, follow me on Twitter or indeed read my monthly horror column in the 14 Times print magazine um, or indeed visit the Facebook page at theflickstechurchforgot.com and do yourself a favor and order Klinger's new annotated Lovecraft. And finally, don't forget the Flicks the Church Forgot.